Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our March Coffee and Conversation, Integrating Career Counseling and Academic Advising. I'm excited um, to welcome a whole team of experts from UNCG's Career and Professional Development uh, to, to welcome us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dana Saunders. I'm the director of the Students First Office um, here at the G and also the current chair of the Academic Advising Council and have really enjoyed um, the additional responsibility this year of coordinating our Advisors Academy and our Coffee and Conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to our career and professional development team here in just a few minutes, but wanted to uh, be sure to start off with a couple of announcements. First of all, if you're um, just now joining us and didn't have a chance to sign in uh, before we begin, please be sure to uh, do so via the link in the chat. I'll send that periodically in over the next few minutes for anyone who's just now joining us. But that'll give us a chance to record our attendees. And also, if you haven't had a chance to join our advisor community listserv, um, we'll add you to that as well. So you can be updated on announcements and events and other things that are relevant to our advising community. If you haven't already, please be sure to mark your calendar for um, our April Coffee and Conversations, which will focus on the academic relief package as we regroup and review and prepare for um, the launching of the spring 2021 academic relief package to students. There will be some important updates as well on the advisor review component of the, of the ARP. And I also wanted to give everyone a heads up to please be on the lookout for a special edition of Coffee and Conversations to be added in early April that will focus on a follow up to Minerva's academic curriculum as that curriculum continues to be finalized and details mapped out um, for our new general education program, which will be launching in the fall. We had a preliminary conversation with the MAC implementation team in February, and I'm um, looking forward to bringing them back to answer some new questions, clarify some existing questions, and help us all as advisors prepare to work with students who will be on the new program and transitioning to the new program if they've already been on the general, our existing general education program. So date is still TBD on that one, but you'll be hearing from me in the next couple of days as we solidify that date. So just know that that's upcoming and we'll work hard to um, work around peak registration and advising. So I know we're really getting in the midst of that right now as well. All right, I think that's all the announcements I have. As always, we'll be recording these and then posting, recording this session and then posting to the Academic Advisor Academy website. So if you wanna go back and review anything that we've talked about um, today, you'll have access to that and be sure to share with colleagues who couldn't join us this morning. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to Megan and the Career Professional Development Team. Good morning and thank you all so much for um, having us this morning, we're excited to spend some time with you all. Um, and for those of you who hopped on after I dropped this comment in the chat, it's so exciting to see um, a group of fun and familiar folks. I think uh, a lot of us who are joining you today from the uh, Career Center are familiar with you and many of us work with you on the regular. Um, and so it's nice to spend some time with, uh, with people who know us. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen, of course, um, and you'll get to know who we all are. Um, but in the spirit of coffee and conversation, while I'm pulling some things up, I'm wondering if anybody just wants to drop their coffee mug in the screen so we can see what everybody's drinking out of. I have a I can't be trusted at Target mug. Stephanie, I'm impressed yours isn't, there's wine in here today. Good. All right, so one thing that you'll notice on this screen is that our team um, uses the language of coaching, career coaching. And for most um, purposes, these words are interchangeable. Um, 
folks around the country uh, are using different language to describe the work of career fill in the blank, if you will, advising, coaching, counseling. Um, and at UNCG, we uh, refer to, to our team um, as um, coaches. So that's the language that you'll see. You may hear that term over and over. Um, and just to give you some context for maybe what we mean when we say that um, is uh, that we're coming to our work um, as a coach, as a motivator, as um, someone who is providing support, but um, you know, focusing on the strengths of students and encouraging them to, um, to find success. So on our call today, um, there are four of us who you'll get to spend some time with. So I'm going to invite um, my colleagues, Christina, Stephanie, and Justin to introduce themselves, and then I will do the same. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Faduk. I am one of the assistant directors and career coaches, and my liaison areas are the School of Health and Human Sciences and the School of Nursing. Um, I've been here since August of 2019, so kind of like a full year before everything happened, I guess a semester before COVID happened. Um, and before coming here, I was doing a similar role in Massachusetts at a university there. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to see so many faces and names that I recognize. So hello to all my friends. If you have not interacted with me and we've never met before, um, I'm Stephanie Larson, also one of the career coaches on the team, specifically the liaison to the Bryan School of Business. Um, I have been here, gosh, Christina, if you started in August, I must have started, what was that, June? Yeah, I think so. June 2019. Christina and I started right around the same time, which is awesome. Um, before that, I was at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, where as an assistant director of our internships, so doing a lot of career coaching and focusing predominantly on experiential learning opportunities for students. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Justin Goldie, and I'm an assistant director and career coach here at the university. And my liaison area is the uh, College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, working specifically with students of both the humanities and the STEM related fields. In the past, I've done you know, a lot of in-depth work with uh, faculty members from philosophy, political science, international global studies. So I love you know, working with students or have a special place in my heart for uh, you know, students from the humanities and from this area. I've actually been here at the university for six and a half years, uh, two as a graduate student, and then I was lucky to be hired on as a full-time um, you know, assistant director and career coach. Um, but before that time, my undergrad was at Appalachian State. So me and Megan always love talking about that, but it's good to be meeting with everyone today. Thanks, Justin. It's harder to talk about it during March Madness, but I think we all feel that about our alma maters. Unless you're Oral Roberts. Um, I uh, am Megan Walters. I have the pleasure to serve as Associate Director for Career Development and my um, primary liaison areas are CVPA and um, currently, um, while we have a vacancy on our team, the School of Education as well. Um, I do a lot of work serving, if you will, as an ambassador from our office. Um, so I do a lot of uh, campus partner work, collaborative work. Um, so you'll see me uh, far less with students and more um, with you all. We have two GAs on our team, Destiny Talley and Ashanti Figures, and both Destiny and Ashanti are um, rounding out their first year in the SAHI program. So that, um, that rounds out the career development team. Um, today, we're gonna share a little bit of information about the office structure. Career and professional development could mean a whole bunch of different things depending on what campus you're on. And I think most of you probably um, are very familiar or more familiar with career development and maybe a coach with um, student employment, but we wanna share with you just to give you a lay of the land, a context for who we are. Um, we want to frame the beginning of our conversation about some common uh, career concerns that we hear from students and what our, um, what technology platforms that we have that are in direct response to those concerns. Um, we assume that a lot of the concerns that we hear um, are happening in your advising meetings as well. And we're excited to give you the language and the tools um, to refer students to those platforms. Um, 
we'll share uh, our career roadmap and um, provide some context for where we think students across the board at UNCG fall into a career path using this roadmap. Um, we'll highlight a couple of existing collaborations, things that we're doing um, on our team already with some advisors who are in the room, I'm sure, today. Um, and then we're going to jump in some breakout rooms and do a little bit of facilitated discussion, um, talk a little bit about what it means to integrate uh, career coaching and academic advising work. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A as well. Um, while we're going through this session, I invite everyone to type into the chat box to come off of mute. Uh, Stephanie, Christina, Justin, and I are laid back presenters. You can derail us. Um, the best case scenario is that we leave this session today and you feel like you got all the information you wanted to get. Um, so if that's not happening, derail us so we can give you the info you want. All right, so I mentioned that we are the career development team. Um, we're probably the team, um, our resources are probably the resources, our services are probably the services that you think of and that students think of um, when they hear career center or career development. Um, so we are a student-facing team. We provide career coaching. Um, our uh, career readiness programming um, is, um, direct action from our team. The practical things that you're probably thinking about like resumes and cover letters and interview skills, that is career development work and that is our team. But we have a couple of other pretty important teams uh, within our office, one of which is student employment. So if you all are campus supervisors, this is familiar to you. You may have hired student employees um, or have directed your advisees to our team for help finding a part-time job on or off campus. So student employment is definitely uh, a major component of our office. We also have um, maybe the best kept secret about our office is an employer relations team. Our employer relations team um, is to employers and graduate schools as the career development team is to students. So they are student or employer facing and they are recruiting recruiters essentially. Um, the month of March and late February, we have been in um, a career fair frenzy and the employer relations team um, makes those connections happen. So they coordinate the events. Um, they're talking to employers, telling the good story of UNCG. They're inviting employers to campus for info sessions, um, but those folks are also um, incredibly available to you all. If you, in your role as an advisor or your role in any other capacity on campus are looking for support from an employer, our team can help um, recruit those folks for you to join you in a class, program, to offer perspective, um, anything you might be looking for. So don't sleep on the rest of our office. We've got a lot of stuff going on uh, that you will probably want to take advantage of too. Any questions about this structure? All right. So these are four like, practical, tangible uh, questions we get from students a lot or concerns we know they have, whether they're asking them this way or not. How do I improve my resume? What's networking? How do I do that? Where should I sh search for jobs? Um, interviewing makes me nervous. Help, please. Um, I'm guessing these things come up in your advising sessions too, right? You're talking with students about their plans for major, about getting from here to there, what success looks like. And these things um, are almost certainly coming up in your conversations too. And we wanna give you uh, a, a, just a taste of the technology platforms that we use specifically to respond to these questions because they would be um, easy for you to refer a student to. Um, it's, it, we love these tools because they help make our work more efficient. Um, and they allow students to work on these questions, whether or not we happen to be available at the moment that they need us. So the first question, how do I improve my resume? We have a tool on campus called VMOC, and you may have heard of this, um, but it is a smart resume platform. A student uploads a PDF copy of their resume, and within 30 seconds, they get probably more feedback than they bargained for. 
that feedback and the score that they earn comes from three areas. Their presentation, so how does it look? Their competencies, how strongly have they told the story of uh, five certain skill areas? And impact, did they tell a good story overall? Um, smart language choice, um, bold words, action, results oriented. Um, and so a student can use this system to make progress on their resume before they come to meet with a coach to tailor that specific document for one incredible opportunity that they're trying to go out and get. We found ourselves, like so many other career coaches around the country, spending maybe too much of our time talking about margins and spell check and things that we did not need to necessarily be talking about with students. Um, and so students can get all of that feedback here in BMOC. And when they upload their resume, they just get a quick snapshot. Here's your score. Here's where that score is coming from. Here are a couple of quick things that you can do to increase your score. And then they can dive in and see a lot of detailed feedback. So we invite students to do this process before they upload resumes to Handshake so they can apply for jobs. Justin's gonna tell you about our answer to what is networking and how do I do it? I wanted to talk with y'all today about career shift and I often call career shift a hidden gem just because there's so many students who don't even know that they have access to it. So the important thing when talking about career shift with our students is that one, our university, our office pays for it so that students can utilize it for free. Normally, if they're using a, an email that isn't a UNCG email, they'd have to pay for it. They have like a 24 hour you know, time period to test it. But if they sign up using their UNCG email, they can use it for free up to six months after they graduate. So that's an important thing to remember when telling them to sign it sign up for it. But CareerShift has so many great features to it. And one of those is the networking feature. So let's say, for instance, we are working with a student and they have no idea what they want, what type of company that they want to work for in the future. They you know, know what they want to major in. They have an idea of what they want to do for a job. But they're just like, I'm just stuck. I have no idea. I type this into Indeed and I get zero results. So they can go to CareerShift and they can actually take a look at companies Typically. And if they're looking to go into nonprofits, if they're looking to go into corporates, if they're looking to go into education, whatever that buzzword is, that industry that they're looking for, they can type that in and they can actually narrow it down to North Carolina or to another state if they're looking to search for outside the state, because this is a national platform. They can actually take a look at several different companies that fit that criteria for the industry that they are looking for employment in. And the nice thing about that is that when you click on company contacts for those companies, it will then show if that information is public information, a list of employees that work for that company, and it can go as high as to like the CEO, the general director, uh, you know, you know, chancellor, if they're looking at education. So it can look go as high as the very top to some of the more entry level positions that that company has or people working there. And as you can see in the graph, when you're looking at the company uh, contacts, um, that person's company email could be public information and could be listed. Uh, their telephone number could be listed if that's public information. And a link to their LinkedIn profile could also uh, be listed. And I see we have a question. Um, so that is a great question about the alumni. So. Um, as I mentioned, since this utilizes a UNC Greensboro email, it would be up to six months after they graduate, unfortunately. Now, Handshake alumni do have lifetime access to, and we'll talk about that in a second. But unfortunately, career shift, it is time sensitive based on the student's access to their UNCG email. So that means our undergraduate students, graduate students, even us in this room, you know, we all have UNCG email. So if you wanted to take career shift for a spin yourself, you could see some of the different opportunities that might be afforded to your students. But this is a great way to network because um, basically when you're networking with different individuals, often I recommend emailing them first, just because when you are, you know, when a student's emailing um, a person, they have that opportunity to kind of explain who they are, 
talk about their own narrative, why they are looking to connect, what questions they have about going into that industry. So it, it offers them a lot of great opportunities to connect with people in the field to conduct some great informational interviewing. And then the second part of career shift is searching for an actual job, searching for a tangible internship, full-time employment. Now, the, one of the things I love about career shift is in addition to it being a national platform, it also utilizes what we call spider technology. So what that means is that it's pulling from Indeed, it's pulling from ZipRecruiter, it's pulling from LinkedIn, and it's actually pulling from the company's website itself. So if you, if you have a student that you're working with and they are saying, you know, I've been to a couple of different websites, I'm not finding what I'm looking for. This is nice because it's all encompassing and it puts all the information in one easy to use platform that as I mentioned in the past is free for our students to utilize. So as you can see on some of these job listings right here, you know, with the Red Shore that comes straight from the city of Salina. Um, one of them comes straight from the University of uh, New Mexico. Um, so it actually comes directly from the website or it could come from a database website like usajobs.gov. Um, so it is all encompassing with some of the different technology that it will pull from um, specifically. And on CareerShift, students have the opportunity to upload their files, documents, they can save job postings for later. And a lot of times they can click on the link and go directly to that website to apply specifically for those positions. Um, but it's a great website. It also offers international opportunities. So a student could look for opportunities. I know uh, last summer they just added um, India to their international opportunities, but South America, Asia, Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand. So there's so many great international opportunities that are afforded to students. So I love this website. I do everything I can to try to tell more people about it. All right, so I'm going to chat a little bit about our Handshake platform. Um, I'm kind of going to first cover from the employer side what that looks like, and then um, from there I'll go into a little bit about what the students can do in terms of uh, searching for jobs, looking for other resources, etc. Um, so mainly from the employer side when they're using Handshake, they're able to create an employer account and post their positions in Handshake. Um, and it doesn't really matter what type of position it is. There are full-time positions, part-time positions, volunteer opportunities, internships. So it's kind of a mixture of everything that's out there. Um, so employers um, specifically create accounts to post their positions in Handshake. Um, and they mainly do that because they want to target our students specifically. So um, they don't just do it at UNCG. Handshake is kind of a, a university-wide um, platform. So um, universities that have access to Handshake and are using this system, um, employers that are uh, posting in their Handshake system, students from our school can also see those as well. Um, so it doesn't just necessarily have to be uh, employers that are around the Greensboro area. You can search for pretty much anything. Um, and then um, a little bit about the student side specifically. So this is usually the main platform um, that I'm usually working a lot with students on. Um, and it usually has to do with uh, the first most popular thing is creating appointments. So if a student asks, you know, how can I create an appointment um, with a career coach, this is usually the easiest way to do that. Um, you can still call the office and we do have um, student workers who um, can answer and they can set it up for them. Usually people want to do it themselves online. So this is usually the easiest way. Um, and everybody as a current student has access to the Handshake platform. So you just have to log in using your normal UNCG credentials. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like when it first comes up. You'll see these different options um, kind of in the middle here, the jobs tab. So that's where you would go if you do want to uh, search for any positions that might be posted. You can also apply directly through it. So um, most of the time employers have access to uh, seeing, well, they, they always have access to seeing all of their applications. Sometimes they require you to go to their actual website to apply, um, but a lot of times you can just apply with your resume and cover letter um, right through the Handshake system. So they can kind of view everything right through the system. Um, the other tab on here that I just wanted to point out was the last one that says Career Center. So that is where a student would go if they do want to request an appointment. So if they click on that, they'll be led to um, what type of appointment do they want to make. They can pick the coach if they want to. 
and then they can pick the time and the availability that works best for them. Um, so that is um, a little bit of an overview with that. And um, the other thing related to Handshake is it's kind of like the one-stop shop for events. Um, so all of our virtual fairs have been directly through the Handshake system. Um, all of our events as well. So if we have like programs and things like that, we, we do post them through Handshake, but it's also a good place to look if you are looking for employer events, because there are a lot of events that employers post through the Handshake system as well. Um, so there's usually sessions with like Bank of America and a lot of larger companies. Um, they could be info sessions, they could be related to a specific topic, but I always recommend students just kind of taking a look um, periodically through the new events that are posted and see if they do want to register for any of those. Um, and the last slide here, um, advisors can request handshake access via this go link. So traditionally you do have to have like a, a student um, UNCG access to like actually log into handshake. Um, but if you do want to access it, you can um, request it through this go link here. And to close out some of our resources, um, we can't not talk about interviewing, right? This is something that I'm sure you all hear from students that I think even for all of us, whenever we're going into an interview, it's still nerves, there's still anxiety, all of those different pieces. So interviewing is something aside from the resumes and, and job searching that we get a lot of questions about. Um, and we're really, really excited to be launching a new platform this particular semester. Um, for those who've interacted with us in the past, interview stream that may sound familiar as a virtual mock interview platform. Um, an interview stream is Fine, I think it works and does the bare minimum of what we need, but we are really excited to make a transition to a new platform called Big Interview. Um, this is something I think Megan might have saved me talking for last because I sound like a sales pitch when I talk about this because I get so jazzed about it. Um, and I love it so much. I'm really, really excited to start launching this out to students. Um, it is ready to go so students can technically access it right now. We just haven't sent up any messaging or targeting uh, targeted messaging to students about it, but if you're working with students, they have full access to it. So Big Interview is like a virtual mock interview tool. And what is cool about the Big Interview platform that our previous platform didn't have is there's a combination of application-based practicing, right? Practicing preset mock interviews in the system where students are utilizing their webcam and they're going through the process of recording their responses to questions, getting feedback on that. But there's also another piece that's a little bit more of like passive knowledge intake, which is through these learning modules. And this is something our old platform did not have. So we're really excited for that piece too. There is a fast track, a mastery track, there's a job search curriculum, there's a first 90 days curriculum. And all of these are composed of different kind of quick video modules that students can scroll through and pick the content and information that's important for them. So for example, in the mastery track, I'll tell students to kind of toggle through the different sections and watch the videos that feel relevant. For example, they might go into how do I analyze the job description so I can better determine what types of questions are going to ask me. Or then maybe they'll scroll down to how do I respond to the question, tell me about yourself. So it gives them this content kind of in that, in those different video modules, they can take all that content away and then go into the actual practice piece. When they are practicing interviews, these are structured in a variety of different ways. We have general practice interviewing, um, so they can start with like a general list of questions. They can start with like an entry level type list of questions. And in that general tab, they can also choose their interviewer. So they could choose someone who might be a little bit more on like the standard side. So a typical, you know, someone who might smile a little bit more when they're asking questions all the way up to someone who might be in the tough category. So I think of this as like low affect, maybe a little bit of a, a harsher tone when asking the questions. So students can kind of practice how they might bounce back and forth between different styles of interviewers. On top of the general practice, students can also practice preset questions based on industry, so they can sort through different industries if they have an industry of interest. Um, there are preset questions based on competency, so for example, a student may say, you know, I've really struggled with talking about my leadership skills in the past, so they might practice that leadership competency mock interview to kind of get more familiar in practicing with that. 
And something that's really cool that's connected to all of these practice interviews, as well as assignments, is a new feature um, that is called the AI feedback feature. And this is something where when students are going through and practicing, after going through a quick calibration process, right, it'll kind of assess like how close you are, it'll kind of assess your eye movements. After going through and saving those videos, they'll pull an AI feedback score and it looks at all of these different things. So it'll look at how frequently you made eye contact with the camera, but it will also assess how fast were you talking, right? How many words per minute did you have? Are you talking really fast? You maybe need to slow that down a little bit. It's also going to pull how many times they said um or filler words. It's going to assess if they had pauses in their response. Were the pauses necessary? Did they make sense or were they a little awkward and broke up their response? They're going to look at how many power words you might have used in your response. It's a really, really cool feature. So that way, when students are going through and practicing, they're getting this automatic feedback right there on the spot. Whereas our old platform students may have had to send out these videos to get feedback from a person, right, which is still an option in big interview. But this is a really, really cool feature we're excited about is that AI feedback. So students are going through, they're learning through these different modules, they're practicing a variety of practice interview questions, gaining that AI feedback piece, but there's also an opportunity for assignments directly through the system. And this is something if you maybe interacted with interview stream in the past, you know, this is something we also did with that platform. So having the opportunity as an instructor to be able to create an assignment specifically for your students with utilizing uh, very customized questions, very customized, uh, uh, like a post post-assessment afterwards, all of those different pieces can be completed in the system. And that way we can make sure students are getting that extra practice that they need to. So this is something that once again, we're in that kind of launching stage and I'm in the process of making a bunch of like how-to videos as well. So when we get all of those, I'll share them out with everyone so you can have some access to the system too. But it's a really, really great platform. We're really excited to share it with students. Um, we're really excited for the new features that we didn't have in the past. And something also to know if you are interested in the potential of maybe doing an assignment or a custom set for a group of students, definitely reach out to myself and I can work with you to get all of that set up in the system. Thank you so much. Um, this is a, a lot of information. Um, there are lots of cool tools that we just shared with you. I'm certain that you have some questions. There are a couple of things I want to mention. One is that um, we, along with the slides that we'll share, we have a reference document that will talk about each of these um, platforms, how students can access them, um, more details, things that, that you know, we want to make sure that you, uh, you have the info on. Um, there's a question about online security and privacy. So any platform that we are um, it, sharing the good word about this morning um, has gone through um, the IT process. Um, many cases that has also gone through, um, and maybe all cases, legal. Um, and so there are um, uh, there are checks in place, right? So all of the um, processes that that any other uh, technology tool would have to go through to be used on campus. These also have gone through that process, so they are certainly secure. Um, big interview and VMOC um, in particular, I think, give students practice using tools that they're going to use during the job search, especially right now. Um, lots of employers are doing at least first round interviews on a recorded platform like this, so it is real life application. Um, we're seeing it more and more now, of course. So students can use this system, practice what it feels like to talk to a screen that no one is looking at. Um, so it, it's good It's good practice, right? Lots of um, practical applications. And last, um, specifically about these four platforms, by no means does this, um, should this indicate that students can just do all this stuff on their own and we don't help them with it also. Um, these tools are meant to supplement the work that we're doing one-on-one. -on -one. There's a lot of baseline foundation information that students can get through these platforms and they are user-friendly enough that students can do them at two o'clock in the morning and we have confidence that they're getting information that we would approve of. 
Um, so it's, it's completely supplemental. Um, but there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, technology, security, Kristen, um, does the platform keep recorded interviews for data or use elsewhere? Um, the the uh, like recorded videos in Big Interview, for example, stay on a student platform and um, administrators of the platform can see them. Um, so for example, if I go in and set up an, an assignment, I can make that assignment public to other administrators or I can make it private only to me. So it depends on the settings of um, the particular interview. But students can't go in and see other student interviews. Um, when our contract ends, all of those files are deleted, all, um, all that. Um, let's see, will Big Interview be helpful for neuroatypical or ADA accommodations? Um, we've been talking about this um, for sure on our team. Um, and Stephanie, I wanna give you an opportunity if you've come across any of this information to, to, um, to share it with the crowd. Um, does any of that sound familiar to you in any training or like reference docs? Okay. Okay. Yeah, not particularly that I've come across yet, but I know there are um, like particular trainings that have come our way that I haven't gone to as an administrator of Big Interview yet. So I imagine that's probably where the content would be held in particular. Yeah. Um, we, one thing that will be rolled out with the Big Interview uh, platform is a series of um, like small bite trainings that either our team has put together or that the platform offers that you can participate in. There are, um, there's a menu of all of that certainly to participate in. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, thinking of a student who's terrified of Zoom and how this might be something to help them gain confidence. Yes, practice makes uh, progress, right? Um, so it's definitely a great tool for practice. Um, and then of course, Joyce, great question about um, non-traditional students, online students, um, particularly those who skew uh, older than the traditional student population. Um, what is our approach to students who are not on their first rodeo? There are a couple of um, approaches, but one thing that our team does um, really well that, that I am incredibly proud of is that we remind students, all of our constituents, that what we have expertise in is a process. And the process is similar for job seekers across the board. So the process of telling your story well, the process of searching for information, vetting that information, that is, um, sorry, I can tell it something's going on. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment because madness just happened on Google. Um, we also, um, if a non-traditional student approaches us or if an alumni approaches us and they have um, specific information or questions, a lot of times we'll workshop that with our team before we take action. Um, because we do want folks to come in and feel like they can trust the work uh, that we're doing. Um, and Brad, I, um, I see that, that uh, you know, that you were basically saying retweet, yes. Um, another population that we see this hesitancy with sometimes is graduate student populations. And, um, you know, it's important for us to share the message. Uh, you know, the process is similar tools are similar um, and everyone on our team has familiarity with a graduate level job search and telling the, the story of our graduate level coursework. Um, so we, you know, despite any academic discipline, we understand how to tell stories. And that's what we do a lot with uh, the more non-traditional populations. Super question. Any other questions about tools? Um, things that we've already mentioned. All right, I think I'm back in business and Google. Sorry about that.
So some of you may have seen this visual before. It's the career roadmap, um, a visual that we use to help students and campus partners and families uh, during SOAR, for example, see the bigger picture of the career process. And we have the career readiness journey, if you will, um, broken up into six major milestones that we know that students either have met already or will meet, um, but this helps us steer folks to um, a particular stop that maybe they didn't spend enough time on. So what I've done here is just broken up these milestones um, by populations that we see most frequently um, needing to have these conversations. So a lot of exploratory students or students who are in major or career identity crisis, if you will, um, we point back to assessment. Who are you? What do you like? What are you good at? What's important to you? Um, milestone two is about exploring majors and careers, essentially, um, but exploring all sorts of information. So we find a lot of exploratory students, um, students who are confident in their major, but not a career choice, students who are confident in a career choice, but not a major. Um, we find a lot, of, um, a lot of students in the second milestone in those categories. Milestone three is about promoting yourself, telling your story, creating documents that tell your story, creating an online presence that tells your story. Um, and a lot of times the students who are really interested in this are those who are seeking internship, job, scholarship, or leadership opportunities. Um, so we spend a lot of time with those students um, on milestone three. Milestone four is about making connections, informational interviews, faculty connections, um, student organizations, just connecting with people or with entities um, to help them feel more confident about the choices that they've made and to make those connections that are gonna get them to their next stop. Milestone five is all about engaging. This is the do something milestone, right? Make sure that you are getting experiences for your resume. Um, all class years certainly are thinking about doing something, right? Getting involved on campus, having a job, um, looking for internship opportunities. Uh, but we do see a lot of juniors and seniors, particularly in this um, milestone. And then milestone six, arrival. Uh, a lot of times these are folks who are nearing graduation, seniors, yes, of course. Um, and the language that's on the screen is, um, you know, homemade, essentially. It, it's, it's um, you know, fitting a traditional population into this roadmap. But this roadmap is for everyone. First, if we're working with non-traditional students or graduate students, and we don't know their history, we don't know if they, you know, earned foundation uh, information in how to build a resume or how to talk confidently about your experiences. So a lot of those basic skills, a lot of the basic processes are um, incredibly important with populations across the board. I can see some chat, chatter happening, awesome. Any of these questions that we need to bring some sound to and talk through, we feel good. Perfect. All right, so we want to take a moment just to share some examples of how our work is being integrated now. Um, and what you'll see on the next two screens, are these are not groundbreaking ideas necessarily, but we want uh, to bring light to some things that are maybe easier to accomplish together that have a lasting impact, that do uh, really good work. So we'll share just a couple of examples of those things. Um, and invite you to ask any questions that you might have. Um, so um, first, uh, our office works closely with the Students First Office. Um, exploratory advisors, uh, we all know each other well. Um, we're doing a lot of cross uh, referral to each other's teams. Um, so there are a couple of 
uh, very specific things that have made this partnership work. One is that our graduate uh, student who manages the exploratory specific uh, newsletter will communicate with exploratory advisors on a regular basis about are there programs that you all are doing that you want me to feature? Um, is this a, an important time in the advising cycle that I need to say this message in this newsletter? Um, and then of course, when Destiny sends those newsletters out, all the exploratory majors who have indicated an interest in it get copied on those newsletters, um, just so that we're all aware of the messages that are coming from every location on campus. Um, we are a starfish referral office, and I think I see some mention of that in the chat, people referring students to our team. Um, this happens all the time, as you would imagine, with exploratory students. Um, and then we have um, worked toward programming that is specific for exploratory students, and we do that in partnership with advisors. Um, so we've um, tested out some career and advising programming series specifically for students who are nearing that um, like critical deadline of, hey, you need to declare that major ASAP. Um, we have worked specifically with the exploratory sections of FYE um, to tailor um, our messages or our assignments. And so these, those are things that are happening in partnership with um, the advising team and the Students First Office. And Stephanie's gonna talk just for a moment about some um, work in the Bryan School. Yeah, as mentioned, I am the career coach liaison to the Bryan School business, so I get to work with the awesome advisors over in that space all the time. So I wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about that partnership and, um, and specifically what it means to me in our office as well, and then I'll invite um, Maggie and anyone else on the team who wants to share anything that I haven't shared. Um, <laughs> let me do me in the parts. Um, so when it comes to collaboration, what felt really important to me uh, when I came in and started this role is I wanted to be able to build a relationship. And what felt really helpful was having like a back and forth space where we could kind of talk about those resources and services. So exactly like what we've just done today, for me to be able to come in to um, a, an academic advisor staff meeting, right? And share a little bit about the resources from my office, but also the space for me to ask questions and hear from folks in that space. Like, what are you hearing from students, right? Because I have my ideas in my head of what students need and what they're thinking and how, how career development is showing up, but wanting to hear a little bit more from those folks to of what are they hearing in their advising meetings? So that way we can have a very collaborative approach to some of those, um, those topic areas. And I think what has been really helpful um, for us in particular is having a direct line of communication for student referrals. Um, back when we were in person, I know I was dropping off stacks of business cards all the time to the office so folks could have my business card like sitting on their desk, really easy to hand to students. Um, and now I know it's been really helpful to have that direct line of communication of emailing a student and just CCing me on it, right? Hey, you talked about feeling concerned about the internship search and our appointment. I'm connecting you with Stephanie, set up an appointment, y'all can talk more about it. Um, so I think that has been really helpful and we've gotten, I think I've gotten a ton of referrals that way and just been able to build a lot of great relationships with students from that. So I've really um, appreciated having that context and knowing that wouldn't exist if we didn't have that building relationship piece at the beginning too. Um, but I'll pause for a moment and see if any of my, my colleagues and friends from the Bryan School have thoughts that I didn't touch on. Um, Maggie, if you want to say a few words or anything like that. Yeah, I'll just chime in and kind of reiterate um, what you're saying about the importance of having that relationship. I know for me, I have so many conversations with students where I, you know, I think talking with someone in career professional development is a really good idea, but being able to say to a student, I know Stephanie and she's a wonderful person and here's how she's going to help you and here's her contact and I already have these stacks again when we were meeting with students in person I had these stacks of here's exactly how you schedule an appointment with her I'm going to copy her on this email you know so and I think we all know that when we make referrals to our students the conversation of here's what I'm recommending and them actually following through with it is really challenging, right? Because it's scary. You know, this is a new thing for them. They don't really necessarily always know what to expect. Um, but I think having that strong relationship gives us as advisors um, 
a much clearer picture of here's exactly what you can expect um, and making that connection just I think I think like you said Stephanie you've seen a lot more students kind of coming in um, because we've been able to do that and I just think it's really important and we all love you over here and we're so appreciative <laughs> of being able to do that. Well I, I appreciate those words too Maggie and I think um, I like I would I wish I had data and numbers in front of me to to show the increase but I imagine we've seen a huge increase in particularly Brian uh, business majors utilizing our services, right? Whether that's through just at least setting up an appointment or or whatever that might look like. Um, and I know I've kind of used my, my partnerships and my relationships with you all to, to refer students, right? Um, I'll, uh, I'll brag about Shannon really quick and know that I sent you an email and said, hey, I met with a student who thinks they might want to do academic advising. Would you like be able to answer some questions for them? And you were like, sure, that's great. So I think just being able to have that, that relationship with folks is so important and, and knowing that we can kind of bounce ideas and thoughts back and forth to each other and knowing that when I'm meeting with a student who's having concerns about their major, I'm going to say, okay, who's your advisor? Let's get you connected with them. Have you even talked to them yet this semester, right? And if they haven't, then that's a whole other thing. So I think that's something that's really important to me and, and the work that we do in our office, um, at being able to, to have that direct line of communication for referrals in particular. Thanks, Jess. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm loving the love fest for sure. Yeah. Some extra context for um, the progress that we've been able to make, um, particularly in the Bryan School, is that before Stephanie joined our team, the primary um, career coach contact was our director, Nicole Hall. And Nicole is fantastic and didn't have the time to do this work thoughtfully, right? That was not her primary role. And um, when we had the opportunity to restructure a different position that had been left vacant, you know, it makes so much sense to, to strengthen that collaboration. Um, so if you are hearing these stories and you're thinking, wait a minute, now I'm a little bit jealous. I want to have that relationship with a career coach. Um, I feel like we've scratched the surface, but I want to do more. Let's do it. Um, we will take the steps that we all can to do this good work together um, and we'll scale it appropriately. Um, any other comments or questions? Thanks, Brad. Um, hey, Megan, I have a quick question just related to those collaborations. I know both the ones that you and Stephanie highlighted are specifically with um, the professional advising centers, but I know we have a lot of advisors here who are faculty advisors or working with specific departments. So not, uh, you reference scale, not quite on the scale of a full school or college. Um, are there opportunities to build those kinds of collaborations even at the program or department level? Absolutely. Um, one name that I saw on the RSVP list, and I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure. Uh, if you're here, Abigail, but uh, arts ed educators, for example, we will do um, you know, a program or a couple of programs a year specifically for students in arts education uh, to prepare for that job search. And so it's highly tailored, it's specific information about um, transferable skills, about the process, and those programs are done in collaboration so that you know, our team can bring the expertise in search process and Abigail can bring the expertise in um, arts education content specific information. Um, so certainly um, we can tailor one-time programs, we can tailor um, semester long approaches. Um, Kim, I see our services available for UNCG online students, the truly online programs, 100% online, absolutely yes. Uh, this is a really great question. So because we have so many supplemental technology platforms, it's easy to access this information, um, but we, we do 100% um, of what we offer to the more traditional on-campus um, students, we offer um, equally to our online students. And I think that uh, before the pandemic, we had a lot of work to do. And since the pandemic, we have learned um, how to do it better. It's a great question. Let's 
Sydney, other resources that are available to students that expand beyond the job search. CVPA students, for example, absolutely also need support organizing portfolios, um, applying to uh, residencies for artistry or similar, um, how to market themselves as entrepreneurs. These are all integral to a career in the arts, but are not necessarily things that would fall under career search. Absolutely, yes. Um, a common thread in what you're talking about here and what we focus on all day is storytelling. Um, we are in the business of shifting student confidence. Um, and so all of the things that you've mentioned here about portfolios, about applying for opportunities, those are all in that same business of storytelling and um, shifting confidence. So even, you know, though I have no idea about um, artist uh, residency from the perspective of an artist, um, there are tips and tricks and tools and processes that don't change. Um, there are a lot of industry specific um, processes that do change from um, industry to industry, from field to field. And that is why, although everyone that's on this call today from the Career Center is a generalist, that we have this liaison relationship. It doesn't make us expert in the content area, but it does allow us to be more familiar with trends um, in the industries and the fields. Um, and we tend to get similar questions from students um, that help us be more prepared to answer those questions that you mentioned, Sydney. Other questions for the good of the group? Absolutely. All right, so we're gonna take just a few minutes in smaller groups. Um, Justin, Christina, Stephanie, and myself will be in each of these rooms to pose some questions, to do some smaller group conversation. Um, about what it means maybe to integrate our work um, and just to get some ideas flowing. And then we'll come back together, um, lift up any of those ideas that came out of those small group sessions um, and we'll have uh, additional time for Q&A. Megan, are you thinking still 15 minutes for our breakout rooms? Yeah, I think, okay. I think that's good, yeah. All right, I'm gonna set them up so they'll automatically close after 15 minutes, but they'll give everybody a 60 second warning. So um, hopefully we don't cut people off midstream. Sound good? Thank you so much. To skip town, you know. So, thank you. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions that I'll, I'll pose if uh, conversation lulls, but I just want to start by um, asking, has the conversation or the sharing of resources um, from this morning prompted any ideas for you? Um, things that, that you can see using or that you would love to um, try in your own work? And I'll drop that question in the chat too, so that if you are in a vision. Yeah, um, I know, well, we, we're, you're coming to my class tomorrow, actually. So um, the career shift is perfect for the assignment. Um, and for my own research, like my research focuses on uh, like web designers and digital creatives. I mean, I'm gonna use that for sure then when I pick that back up, so. Yeah, the tools are super helpful. I was thinking about the interview tool and just um, when I went on the job market, when I finished my PhD program, I applied for a couple of jobs and they had like online video platforms. Uh, and I was, I never really did those because it just, I had the ability to be exclusive, but for an entry level job seeker, like being able to handle those and not be freaked out and do a good job with those is going to be really key. So that's going to be a tool that I'm really going to recommend to students. And actually, I mean, uh, I teach a 
class for like a capstone class. And I'm going to mention that to the capstone students literally on Thursday. So tomorrow, um, just, yeah, the, the platforms uh, beyond handshake, especially are, are super key and, and really exciting to see. That's awesome. Good timing. Um, my lens is a little bit different, maybe than a traditional academic advisor. I work with students who have been academically suspended from the university. And I'm really interested in investigating like where is the disconnect between their success um, and their performance and their dreams and everything like that. And I feel like I have a hunch that for many students, this idea of fear or uncertainty about their future direction or this compulsion to enter a certain career for a sense of security may be a source of some of those choices and behaviors. So I think it might be useful to get some collaboration on board about like demystifying the process of getting a career. Like you don't have to be a STEM major to be setting yourself up for a good life, for example, if that's not like where the student's strengths or interests really are. Um, so I see a lot of that decision-making. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at right now and exploring those ideas. I love that. Absolutely, information uh, can be power in this process. Um, and there's so much information out there. I think that that is one of the difficulties for students is that they're in a four year information overload. Um, and so hopefully these tools just can point students to um, legit sources, if nothing else. Yeah, Gail. So this is slightly off topic of what your question is, but um, sometimes I will interact with prospective students um, who just happen to want to do business just because they think they can get a job doesn't mean that it's necessarily the, the right major for them. And then we also interact a lot with students who want to come back and get a second degree which coming back and getting a second bachelor's degree may not always be the right avenue for that prospective student. So I don't know if you all have maybe reached out to our admissions counselors so they can start maybe asking some of these questions in their interactions. Um, I know that sometimes we all think, well, that's not my job, but if we can get the student started on the right path from the beginning, um, by the time they get to an academic advisor and by the time they get to you all, they might have, I don't know, a better path in front of them or they may have educated themselves slightly earlier. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, and a positive outcome of a pretty um, dreary series of years of um, the economy after 2008, really, has prompted especially families to be thinking about this. And um, because that's true, we have been afforded the opportunity to get in front of a lot of groups during um, admitted student days, for example. So this past week, you know, we were in front of students and families um, talking about exactly what you're saying. It's important to start early. And the experience that we had in college and our relationship with the idea of work is not what is currently true for our students. Um, and so we do, we, we do have um, a lot of opportunities to get in front of students and families. And one thing that um, uh, like as soon as absolutely possible, we give students access to Handshake. So as soon as they participate in SOAR um, and they go through um, registration, course registration, that prompts us to invite them to Handshake so that they can start looking for opportunities and they can get familiar with the language of, you know, searching and uh, resources that we have available. Um, so we, we do try to start early there um, and we're lucky to have um, access to first year students um, in particular through the st Students First Office and through FYE courses and programming, but you're absolutely right. Um, does anyone else uh, in, the, in the room today share that sentiment? we had experiences, conversations with students in that way? Definitely. I think we see that a lot in the business school, but also thinking about um, 
thinking about a lot of students, especially in the last couple of years, are avoiding leaving the business school or leaving school as a general because they're they're wanting the security and knowing that they're going to have a position that they're going to be able to take care of their family. Um, and they, they don't have that guarantee that they're going to get a job and they think the longer they stay in college and they have that financial aid to pay the bills, they're going to be okay. And so I'm seeing a lot more of that. Well, if I'll add a second major, then I'll be more employable or I add that minor, then that'll get me that job that I'm looking for. And so looking for resources on those add ons and looking for ways to to clarify to a student how you know, having a double degree may or may not be financially worth it. Um, and, you know, we are part of the business school. So thinking about that return on investment and, you know, if they're taking on more debt or avoiding entering the work world because they're, they're afraid of what's, um, what's coming, managing that part of the, the development in their career and professional life. Just to go off of that, um, Megan, you alluded to how you visited um, for a session that we had called Postgrad 101 that was about the time directly after a student graduation graduate graduates from CVPA, um, but we are also including a new session this year called First Year um, 101, and that's really about sustaining a job in the first year of teaching, because um, I work with um, arts teachers. So they're, they're very um, concerned slash um, they are anticipating this first year of teaching and um, wanting to get tips and tricks on how to sustain that job because it's it's quite arduous that first year of teaching. So um, that's something that we're going to focus in on this year. It's an important conversation and um, something that uh, you likely could not have seen on the screen um, about big interview is that one of the training modules they have available is about the first 90 days on the job. And that is meant to be across industry, but what are the things to be thinking about in these first 90 days? How do you establish who you are um, as a working person? Um, and so I wonder, Abigail, if some of those tools might be helpful in that in that program. I'll connect with you about it. But those are conversations that I, I don't think people are having in a formal way. Like, how do you how are you going to make it your first year? Right. We do a lot of work getting people to the finish line um, of graduation and helping them find a job. And then we say congratulations. And there's a lot of work still yet to be done. So I, I love this focus, Abigail. One of the questions on my list, um, we have you know, been afforded the opportunity to tell you a lot about our work and the things that we do. And I'm wondering what you wish career coaches knew about your work as an advisor. Megan, I'll, I'll mention something. I, I work exclusively with online students in the business school. And so I would, I would say probably 85% of our online degree students go part-time or close to part-time because they're parents and they're working professionals. And so most of them aren't looking to land an internship or a job. They're in a job that they they want and they need the degree to keep that job or to get a promotion. And so kind of knowing more about uh, for supply chain majors, a really common thing that I get asked dealing with professional development is how do I get my green belt or Six Sigma or, you know, pretty advanced questions you don't expect to hear from an undergraduate a lot. Um, and so I find that our, the students in our online programs are really at a different place professionally, even though they may be at the same place academically in sophomore junior level coursework. Um, they may have 15 or 20 years work experience 
um, and have the knowledge and want, you know, as they're getting their degree, add some other professional credentials uh, or just kind of sharpen their professional um, outlook, I guess. Uh, thank you for that perspective. And I saw um, that I wasn't the only one nodding along with that question with those thoughts. Um, we, uh, we certainly can um, help folks. Usually it's, it's couched in uh, with negotiating a salary or um, benefits packages, right? So we do that, we do that work for certain. Um, but when you were talking about the experience of some of these online students, I uh, tend to think of them in a similar way uh, that I think of veteran students trying to um, make sense of their experience for civilians or to talk about the thing that they know intimately that is hard to describe. Um, and I wonder if that, um, that process of, you know, telling, telling your story to an audience who doesn't know it, right? So the, the certifications that you were mentioning, like if that student comes to ask one of us, for example, about how do I go out and get this certification or how do I talk to my supervisor about this class that I took that they've never even heard of, um, I imagine that there's a lot of translating that's happening in your, in your world and in ours. Yeah, for sure. Do we handle certifications? Is there a specific set of resources to send to students? So if the question is, um, do we have access to help students gain certifications? Um, no, uh, the short answer is no. Dana, I left the room on accident. Uh, I'm gonna just finish answering that really quickly. Yeah, sure. And if um, you can wait till everybody gets in here. And that yeah, way, yeah. Good. Thank you. I was like, where did she go? Bye. <laughs> yeah, where I just, <clears throat> a lot ahead. of our students want, you know, to work in IT. And so they like, you know, kind of need A plus, um, the Cisco certified network analysis, CCNA, those sorts of certifications are kind of like the entry level ones. And there's not really a good way for them to get them on campus that I know of. So I was just wondering if you guys have any resources to that extent. So. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for those of you popping back in, um, the question is, do we work with students who are trying to seek additional certifications, especially those that are not offered on campus, um, technology certifications, et cetera. So I can think of a couple of students in particular that are coming to mind who, wanted to supplement their degree with, um, you know, any number of certifications um, that I worked with to help identify those at um, GTCC, for example, um, and to work through um, how that schedule fit is what you're looking for, a requirement or a cherry on top, um, and trying to find the, the, the return on investment. Um, essentially for those certifications. And so some of you are working with students who absolutely are required to get those certifications. And so we'll identify sources. Um, we don't have a, like I wouldn't say we have a database, for example, um, Zach or anything that's like a, here is where we would point students, um, but we would work together to, to find the information. Great question. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if any comments, any questions, any ideas um, bubbled up that, um, that you'd like to share with the larger group. I just thought of a question actually when our group was talking, Amanda Everhart, Brian Major, Pfizer, <laughs> Stephanie, hey. Um, I am curious, if other advisors have experienced this as well, but over the past 
six months, and I'm guessing it probably has to do with the pandemic, but I have had seniors close to graduation want to add another major on. And I, I'm, like I said, I'm guessing it's because they're so uncertain about what's happening in the future. Um, so from your perspective, do you guys still have the jobs coming in like you did before? I mean, are they, are they still out there? Are there still a lot of opportunities for students so that we can kind of help to make them feel a little bit better about the uncertainty? Yeah, I want to give a chance for um, Stephanie, Christina, or Justin to answer that question because you've been hearing my voice a lot, but yes, lots of jobs. Well, I wanted to say one thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about career shift is the feature that they added was the ability to look for remote opportunities. And what I've seen is that there's a lot more trends of different employers posting, you know, working from home or remote opportunities, um, you know, different things along those lines. And actually with career shift, it actually has a big national list. I think it's like 8,000 8, different employers where during the pandemic, it showed you know, who was hiring, who was unfortunately going through a hiring freeze and who unfortunately was going through laying off um, you know, different things because of budget and different things like that. Um, but to answer your original question, you know, there are definitely job opportunities available with different majors, different industries, different things along those lines. Um, and, you know, when talking with different employers, you know, there was that question of transferable skills. But a lot of times when students are, you know, about to graduate with their major, um, you know, they're formulating their narrative. They're talking about what they bring to the table with their skills and their strengths um, when they're applying for specific positions, that how they would make a great addition to that team. And, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons with the virtual career fair. Unfortunately, one of the cons is I think that a lot of our students don't get that opportunity to see, you know, a random employer on the side, because I know there's several great employers like Enterprise that, you know, come to our career fair, and a student may not think like, I want to work for Enterprise, but then they meet Jasper or they meet Amy, and it's just like, whoa, those two people are amazing, and, you know, I really want to work for that company now. Um, so basically, to answer, that's a really long way of answering your question, but the, the job opportunities are still there. It may look a little bit different or some industries may, you know, you know, it may still be in that holding pattern and seeing what the future holds for them. Because I know that some companies said, you know, we want to be in person until summer 2021 at the earliest, um, you know, and they were offering more remote opportunities. Um, but there are still plenty of opportunities out there. We certainly experienced students getting internship opportunities with organizations they before COVID-19 would have never been able to connect with. So I think that's one positive unintended or unexpected outcome of this. Um, and that students were able to do these internships in a spring or fall semester. Um, and so for it, it, certainly it's hard. There are industries that are struggling. Um, and so it's not all rosy but there are certainly opportunities. One thing I'll add to that really quick, Megan, um, we are also, we talked about uh, newsletters very briefly earlier when we were talking about collaboration um, and each one of the coaches is sending a tailored newsletter to their liaison area. Um, we typically do this bi-weekly, but with career fairs, it's been happening every week. Sometimes they might get two a week. I know some of the Brian students were hating me around spring career fair because I was sending them 8,700 emails. Um, but what we try to include in these emails are uh, specifically going through Handshake and pulling jobs and internships that we feel relate to some of the majors represented in our liaison area. So we're pulling some of those in hopes that maybe a student will click on it and then continue searching too, right? Um, but then we're also trying to pull things like what are some different events that might be happening? So if we have an alum coming to speak with students who is in you know, the entertainment industry, how can we make sure that's getting tailored and spread out to you know, media and film studies majors and communications majors? So with that too, I know um, open rates are kind of hit or miss, it kind of depends, but that's something that students can also always anticipate and expect from us is 
we'll do some of that like initial searching for them, give them some ideas to look at, and then hopefully they can continue from that process too. So with that, um, and I know even for me with just doing searching for my newsletter, I'm like hopeful with the amount of opportunities I've seen pop up, the amount of internships and full-time roles. Um, so that gives me a little bit of hope for the future too, for some of our folks, but that's something that you can also, um, you know, anticipate that students will be receiving from us as well to kind of give them that like first step of, of here's some things that you might be looking at or here's some things that are posted in the system. I also just wanted to add on to that. Um, I know that I have a couple of advisors that I always CC on my newsletters. So if anybody wants to be CC'd on those newsletters, just let your coach know and that's easy for us to do. And if you're wondering how to get those folks and you don't know us yet, here's some contact information. You can contact any of us and we'll get you on the right on the right list if you're interested in it. I just noticed there was an extra at in my email, so I just put the at at. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yes, it's an underscore. Sorry about that. Good luck finding Christina. Anything else that um, came up in your smaller group um, that feels like, I bet everyone wants to hear this. It's a good idea or a common question. You want feedback from others. Something that we talked about in our group um, and that we've heard comments and read comments from the beginning of our session today is about um, approaches with non-traditional populations. And um, I will say that uh, what is true is that our team is talking about various populations, um, online students, graduate students, non-traditional students on a regular basis. And we're not doing it enough because people don't know. So um, one thing that I would invite all of you to do is that if, um, if there are um, concerns you have, uh, questions that you have, ideas that you have that you want to pass along, even if it is um, like Elisa's question, the process that we talked about today feels very undergrad oriented. What efforts are being done to address grad students? send that question on in to us, we'll answer it for you, and then we'll um, make every effort to make that clearer uh, to the wider campus. Um, this question in particular, um, I'll just say that we work closely with the graduate school. So um, Dr. Bell, um, the communications team from the graduate school, um, the Graduate Student Association, uh, we work with them to promote our opportunities to answer questions and to demystify uh, the process. We are not only a, um, uh, an office who serves undergraduate students. We absolutely work with graduate level candidates um, and we need to tell that story better. And you're successful, Shannon. It worked. <laughs> awesome. All right, Megan, it sounds like we're all questioned out on our end. Thank you so much to you and the rest of the folks from CPD. I think you've shared some really great resources. Um, I've gotten the wheels turning on some opportunities for collaboration and ways that we as advisors can continue to integrate career coaching into, into our regular work with students. Um, unless there are any final comments or chats or questions, I think it sounds like we're ready to wrap it up there. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you didn't get a chance to, uh, to sign in, please be sure to do that. I will drop um, the 
the link in the chat one final time in case you missed that earlier when we were first joining. And otherwise, don't forget to uh, mark your calendars for our April sessions coming up soon. The, the MAC revisit for as we prepare for our new general education program, uh, that date is to be determined, but you'll hear from me soon. And then of course, our academic relief package reboot and review coming up at the end of April. In the interim, if you've got any ideas for future coffee and conversations or any feedback, please don't hesitate to send my way and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks everybody. <laughs>